This is a presentation of DirecTV, exclusive home of the Red Zone Channel, the Fantasy Zone, the Dan Patrick Show, 20 years of NFL Sunday Ticket, the Rich Eisen Show, and America's premier source for sports television. First question, if LeBron came back to play in Miami, would you buy his jersey? I would buy his jersey just so that I could burn it in the lobby of the Fountain Blue in front of his children on, on Easter Sunday. He's a horrible person, Pop. See, I'm not convinced that LeBron James is playing in Cleveland. I believe it's a conspiracy led by David Stern, who's running the NBA through his puppet Adam Silver, just so people will love LeBron again because no one wants him playing in Miami. Same question. If there's another show, you can go on and host that. Which show you go on and host that? The, the box, box score. Start right now. I don't know a lot about sports, but I can drink a lot of beer. My motto is simple. C's get degrees. Need a long, inappropriate hug? I'm your man. I think I'm smarter than you, because I probably am. Howard Cowan for box score. Hello and welcome to the Box Around. I'm Brock in Los Angeles, joined by the Danettes in Milford, Connecticut. Uh, you guys had some great guests on DP today, a wide array of topics. Uh, Polly, was it tough to shift from gear to gear to gear? No, not, to be honest, not really. We, uh, I hate to be, I hate fake humility. No, we know what we're doing. Uh, when there's a bunch of topics, Dan knows, I'm crediting Dan for the most part, we know how to go gear to gear to gear without being heavy handed about it or being paranoid that you go from a serious topic to a, a fun topic in a matter of seconds. Well, I think a lot of hosts worry about that, like, well, switching gears here and not to make light of this. No, just just go. Just talk like you talk in a conversation. Uh, how many times are you in a conversation and you just switch gears in midstream and go with it? That's what Dan does, and we've just followed suit. All right, well, one of the heavier topics, uh, you had Rusty Harden on, who is Adrian Peterson's attorney, and he talked about how Ray Rice is having an effect on his client. Are we looking at Adrian Peterson through the prism of Ray Rice with the punishment or what is viewed as lack thereof, therefore there's an overpunishment for Adrian Peterson. I, I think clearly so. Um, the grand jury that heard this case originally heard from Adrian for over three and a half hours where he voluntarily appeared, uh, cooperated with everybody, and they initially decided not to indict him. And then uh, that was on a Thursday, and then on Monday or Tuesday, the TMZ came out um, with the Ray Rice video, and that Thursday, the same grand jury decided to reconsider the case and then returned an indictment. And then after the prosecutors looked at it fully, they decided that it wasn't child abuse, and we hoped and thought that he'd be eligible to get back on the field of play. Yeah, I mean, that's a bit of the Chewbacca defense because Dan asked him a question. I'm not sure if that was edited. And he kept on throwing in more details that were a little bit off topic, but they sounded like they were on topic. But if you broke it down, he was going off topic. Like, for example, Adrian Peterson voluntarily showed up. Mm -hmm. Like, he was definitely getting his statements in there, making statements. So uh, I actually, like, it's funny because I, I, Rusty Harden, something about the way he was talking, everything made sense. He made some very good points, but he didn't totally directly answer the questions, which is why I think some people are a bit skeptical of that defense. I'm always skeptical whenever we have a lawyer on the show. Generally, a lawyer by nature has an agenda for one side or another, and I do not fault them for it. But it seemed like Rusty was giving pretty specific facts that either he's either completely lying or telling the truth. And I assume he's telling the truth because he'd be called out on it. So when he tells that, you know, he was, the grand jury didn't want to pursue this, then the Ray Rice thing hits TMZ, and then they pursue it. I found that pretty interesting, and I didn't think I knew that timeline specifically. So I love when we are presented with new information on the story. Well, the boss didn't take it easy on Harden when he was asking these questions about AP. What did you think when you saw the pictures of that four-year-old boy? Andrew? Oh, like everyone. It was, it, you know, you just cringe. And then when you find out how it happened, which was with a switch, not a branch or anything, um, and the switch wrapped around the front, and that caused some injuries, and, and it, it, you, you, you cringe. Any parent, any person does. And so, and Adrian felt badly as soon as he realized what had happened. But why did he say he was still going to do that, Rusty? Because he believes he has the right. He didn't intend that he was going to go and inflict those kind of injuries. That was never intended. But he believes. And, and this is a parent's decision in a lot of ways, that there are limits, obviously. But he, he truly believes that he is the person of discipline and accomplishment that he's had in spite of everything because of the way he was raised. And it's so 
complicated, this uh, issue, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm normally the person that just reacts with my gut and reacts almost wildly about things and like really uh, emotionally. And for, I try to stay like level headed with this one and keep it even and try to look at the whole thing and look all of these, you know, domestic abuse, child abuse, all of these issues uh, all the way through big picture. Um, because it is, it's shocking, yeah, to see those pictures and to think of uh, what a big strong man did to a little boy. Um, but th there's just so many facets to it that it's tough to talk about publicly, especially on national radio and television. Um, and, and always, you have to make sure that you're getting your thoughts across exactly the way you want them to, uh, because there's just a lot of eyes and ears. Yeah, we really don't have rehearsals here. We don't really rehearse what we're gonna talk about. Seton and Dan talked about it a little before the show, but I, I tell people that this is like doing a column live, writing a column. If you're a columnist for a paper or a magazine, you write your column with no one watching, you edit your own column, you have an editor look at it, and then maybe hours later or a day later, it goes into a magazine. Seton is doing a live column with his thoughts on the air. And also, we're more producers than we are mm. columnists or opinion makers or broadcasters. Mm. So we're even more, we don't have enough reps at this to just be gl as glib as like a Bomani Jones or a Dan Levitt. You know, and I think I, I actually get more, like today I came in really fired up after hearing some people talk about this. And I actually thought that everything they were saying was like actually damaging to like the American society. I thought it was that far off base. But they were saying really good <clears throat> sound bites that would get people really fired up and like, yeah, let's go burn the place down. This is what, and it's like, no, like everybody has to take a step back for a second and really look at this. Um, but, you know, sound bites are sound bites. And, and, and you also have to be careful, like if, you know, what Dan had said earlier, and then, you know, you, it requires some extra explanation beyond that. It's, you know, it's not black and white to just say, you know, Roger Goodell does, or the NFL doesn't have a right to tell a player how to discipline their children. But you also, at the same time, don't want to come across that you're condoning that type of violence at the same time that you're saying that. Fritzy, how many times have you reached out to uh, Adrian Peterson since this whole thing uh, started? Uh, many times since uh, ever since the news broke, you know, we've been uh, looking to uh, give him the platform, and uh, you know, obviously we're a little biased, but uh, there's no one better than uh, Dan to ask the questions, and there's no better place than than this show. If and when Adrian is going to talk and not put out, you know, press releases, we hope that it would be on our show because we would give him the uh, most fair and uh, and professional way of him being able to express his thoughts and his views, and we'll continue to do so, whether it's uh, through uh, through Rusty Harden's office or. His uh, his agent uh, Ben Dogra, who uh, just previously uh, exited CAA, we're uh, going to keep pushing, and hopefully Adrian Peterson uh, can be part of the show. Uh -oh, what are you talking about, <clears throat> Paul? You said that uh, being you you mentioned being glib like Dan and B Bomani. Do you think they can't cover uh, tough topics with Pappy in the middle there? Oh no no no! I no I love uh, I, I love Dan Levitard and his. Uh, I don't watch his TV show because of the time of day it's on, but I, I listen to his radio show, and I'm always very impressed about people who could speak glibly and with depth in the moment. Like we'll, we'll ask Bob Costas a question, he'll take a beat of a pause and he'll say something you're like, oh my goodness. And then same with Bomani Jones, and he's Bomani's the fastest talker I've ever heard on, on sport in sports, and also one of the deepest, well, most well thought out guys. Those usually don't go together. You know, fast is usually haphazard and loud and, and really dumb. And guy, I, I listen to Levitard's show a lot, and I like that they can be goofy, but then when it gets serious, they've got that. And Dan's got that, too. And uh, we have different guests on the show that have depth of thought in the moment that it's, it's, it's a skill that's not recognized enough. McLovin, who would you rather have on the, uh, the show? Would you rather have AP or Ray Rice? <sighs> wow. Today? That's a great question. Man, I... <clears throat> You know, I'm leaning towards Ray Rice because I would like to hear Ray Rice say, I told Roger Goodell everything in that room. Uh, I think that, honestly, I mean, Ray, Adrian Peterson, one thing about it, it's all been out in the open. There's that, he's, you know, and then Ray Rice to a certain extent, but there's more information to be unearthed by Ray Rice. So I would lean that direction, even though today, Adrian Peterson is the story. The thing I find appealing about Adrian Peterson uh, is that he seems to be a bit more defiant uh, in his case than Ray Rice is. Mm. And so there's a little extra heat there with uh, Adrian Peterson. So he, he could be interesting. Fritzy, I'm going to get your call on this. If Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson called at the exact same time oh, and, boy. and you can only put one on and you don't get the other. Yeah. 
Your pick is? I would say Adrian Peterson today. And that, you know, we all know how the sports world works. Things can change from day to day. All of a sudden, something can happen. And now tomorrow, Ray Rice becomes the uh, bigger story. But as of this moment, if both uh, lines rang uh, based on what everybody's been talking about, I would uh, I'd lean towards AP. I, Even though I agree with uh, what you guys were saying, that I think I think Ray Rice, what McLovin was saying, is a more interesting person. I'd rather hear from uh, Ray Rice, but going with the news I, of the day, it's yeah. definitely AP. I feel like Peterson. Wait, wait. So you, I don't understand. Yeah. You'd rather hear from Rice, but you would pick Peterson. That's interesting. But, but, I'm not, yeah, I'm not so doubting right, you. No, no, yeah, no I'm saying based that. on the news of the day and what everybody's been talking about, I think the big get, for lack of yeah. a better word, mm -hmm. would be AP. But uh, that's not to say that uh, I still think all in all, looking at uh, the subject matter and what uh, and what Andrew yeah. was saying, Ray Rice in general to me would be the well, more interesting interview. I think Peterson's going to talk within two weeks. I think Ray Rice has been sitting there not talking, not talking. I don't know when Ray Rice is going to talk. We know Peterson mm -hmm. is probably going to talk soon. I think he is anyway. Ray Rice, when does he talk? Who's that? And, and there's with? so much of a mystery there yeah. still. You're right. I mean, that's there's so much still to find out about what's going on there with Ray Rice. Okay, coming up, let's lighten the mood. Let's lighten the mood. We're going to watch how terrible the Danettes are at golf. That'll make you smile. <laughs> Oh, mother of God. <laughs> <laughs> is that the swing you, you actually use? <laughs> it is, actually. That's the oh, one. That's man. the wow. one I got. He, that was he, some serious moving parts there. See, see, if you start oh. with your feet like <laughs> Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> it's, it's kind of difficult to turn your hips or move your weight. Oh, geez. that looks like we're holding a butcher's knife. Just hit that marginally. Fritzy, seriously? Oh! <laughs> they set up the middle. That's beautiful footwork. <laughs> beautiful footwork. <laughs> you know, not many people. He avoided the even pass a, rush. Even a left hander. Not many people. You know, an impact you know, or like this. Like a bowling move. <laughs> you know? When you try to pick up the 7 10 split. We are back here on the box score. The legendary David Faraday dropped by the man cave today with a little advice on the golf swings there. Seaton, you've often mentioned that he's one of your favorite guests. What is it about David? Personality, he's just super funny guy all the time uh, in a sort of low-key way. Uh, and you, you always have, he leaves you with the feeling that there's always something like another huge punch is coming right around. <laughs> where you're like, man, this dude just got jokes on top of jokes on top of jokes. It reminds me of if David Spade was a golf analyst, because uh, Spade can't not be funny. And Faraday was saying stuff that was not actually funny, and Seton looks over and I'm giggling. And I was like, he's such a funny person, I could see it coming. And to have him tear apart our golf swings was a real treat. It's like the accent combined with the references and analogies, uh, just just like the perfect storm of humor. And since we already know he's funny, you're already kind of like a good comedian. You're already on standby, and you like you want to laugh, and he just pushes it over the top by making some of these bizarre references and using sometimes blue language, uh, which uh, you never know what you're going to get uh, from David as we saw again today. Uh, looking forward to the boss being on his show. I love that show. Well, Faraday played at the Masters, and one of your favorite things to do on the show is the Jim Nance Masters imitation, and the boss got it going a little early. Let me throw it out to you, because I'll never get to host. So if I'm, if I'm Jim Nance here. <laughs> yeah. Hello, friends. Mm. How does that, I mean, just right there, is that hello friends sound all right? No. Um, it didn't sound warm? No, well, there's more of a hello friends. Oh, stretch it out? Well, uh, yeah. And, and, and on an uptick? Yeah. Hello friends. Yeah, that's, yeah, there you go. That's much better. The leaderboard is crowded. And let's go on to David Faraday at 16, David. Let's he... not. No McCord's at 16. So there's pointless going there. That's just one of those moments. David is as great as he's always uh, been with us uh, when he comes on periodically on the phone, having Dan do uh, Jim Nance for David Faraday right there in studio. And we were all excited and geeked to begin with that uh, David was coming into the studio. And then seeing them going back and forth trying to uh, to do Jim Nance uh, together face to face is you know was captured so much better than uh, you know when they uh, when they try to do things like that uh, over the phone. So I just thought it was great. Just even seeing David in person and then seeing that uh, just made it that much better. That being said, David's a very smart man and knows where his bread is buttered and he is not going to make fun of Augusta. <laughs> so if you notice that bit, he was in it, but he wasn't all in. Mm -hmm. And if you think David Faraday is dumb enough to jab Augusta on a national radio and TV show for a couple cheap laughs, you got another thing coming. You don't do that and he didn't do that. Uh, Faraday talked about how announcers use dead air to tell a story. Polly, do you think this is a lost art? Well, yes and no, but you got to look at dead air with calling a sporting event or doing a radio show. Dead air is not good for a radio show. 
<clears throat> but dead air on TV, radio, for announcers, especially radio, Vin Scully does it. Listen to a Dodger game sometimes, and you'll hear, like, you can hear the PA man go, next up, Andre Ethier, and you'll... Yeah. And he doesn't try to top it and go, Andre Ethier up to bat. He just lets it go. He goes, first pitch, ball. And then he'll let it play out. And you'll, hear, and you'll hear the clamoring of the hot dog guy. Right. And you'll hear the noise. And you'll hear the PA. And you'll hear people yelling out stuff. And Vince Scully probably does less words per broadcast of anybody. And if you could look back at some of the great moments in golf, when a guy does something, the, the golf uh, announcers, they shut up and let the, the gallery do the work. Well, before we go, let's bring back some of this beautiful hacking that went on this morning. Uh, Fritzy, you want to talk us through <laughs> what was going through uh, this, this swing of yours, please? Yeah, you know, I'm more of a miniature golf guy, and, the, and, and even that uh, is uh, questionable when I'm playing that, but I'm just... Uh, you know, I, I have a Little League baseball background and no golf background at all, which is very obvious there. And <laughs> I was uh, I was nervous to just, I just, all I wanted to do was make contact with it. I wasn't going to be able to keep up with these guys with, the, you know, the technique or how far I was going to hit it or hitting it straight or anything like that. I just wanted to find a golf club that uh, was geared towards a lefty and make any kind of contact at all, even if it was just a, like a little ground ball up the middle, which is basically how I hit all of those. Well, some things just can't be unseen. Okay, stick around when we come back. The Rose <laughs> are going wrestling. I just want to thank the Danettes for what they put their bodies through doing the show every day after DP. <laughs> the box score is still real to me, damn it. Take it easy, man. We are back here <laughs> in the box score. Seeing we're well aware that wrestling's still real to you, damn it. Uh, uh, if you were to leave this job, I mean, what, what would your uh, wrestling name be and what's your finishing move? Well, you know, I actually went to wrestlingname.com and they suggest names for you. And the two that they gave me were Bipolar mm. Soul Taker mm. and Napalm Satan, which uh, I'm kind of into the Napalm Satan thing. Uh, although, I'm not exactly sure what my finishing move would be off of that. Um, it might be kind of graphic. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. Well, over the years, there have been some pretty amazing characters that have graced wrestling, so we uh, thought we'd go ahead and put you guys to a test. Uh, you're going to guess whether it's a wrestler or just someone we made up. It's row versus row, <laughs> and uh, let's get this cage <clears throat> match going. The first one's for you, the front row. Steelzies? No, Steelzies. Uh, the wrestler is Fantasio, <laughs> a magician wrestler who can magically remove the underwear of both his opponents and referees without touching them. Wrestler or not? I'm gonna say no. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and say no with Seton. That being said, if WWE doesn't initiate this character soon, they're nuts. That's a great description. Nuts. nuts. Well, it actually is a wrestler. Uh, he wrestled in 1995. No way! Oh my God, oh, no way. He actually goes by Fantasio, but whatever. Uh, correct, okay, <laughs> Frank Crow. <laughs> The wrestler <laughs> is Goon. Still sporting his hockey gear, this hockey player turned wrestler was kicked out of every league he ever participated in. No. No? No. I was going to initially say yes. I'm a huge yes. pro wrestling guy, oh, yeah? and I have not heard of Goon. All right, so we're going to say no. <laughs> no heard to Fantasio? Goon. Well, I'm sorry to report that he is a wrestler. Back in 1996, he wrestled with the WWF. <laughs> Wow, that might as well be 76, that picture. Look at That's that. That's 1996. Ron Duguay hairdo. Back to the front row. This wrestler was known as Repo Man. He was actually, what his name promises, a Repo Man who used his skills to get even in the ring. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to go yes on that. I have no idea, so our answer is yes. He's like, you've been towed. Uh, <laughs> good guess, gentlemen. Uh, absolutely wrestler, 91 through 93 with the There's WWF. A here, all these are wrestlers. Brock, that looks like you in one of your bits. Yeah, it <laughs> I think it is. Back yeah. row, keep the match going. The wrestler is the beekeeper, who would don a beekeeper's mask during his intro and would place bees in his opponent's dressing room pre-fight. Oh, they got to the do that. The theme seems that to be that these sounds are all really consistent, But the fact that they've all been real at this point, there's got to be the, one. Knowing the devious producers of the box score, I'm gonna say this is fake, just based I on agree. game theory. No, there's no beekeeper wrestler. Well, there you have none. guessed correctly. This is not a wrestler. He looks pretty, uh, <laughs> I mean, pretty how, scary. How, how would you not see the bees in the dressing room coming every time? Like, all right, the next week you're wrestling the beekeeper. Okay, hey, I'll just wait here in my dressing room. Yeah, if you walk into your dressing room and a guy is leaving with a net 
uh, over a space, something might be up. Buzzing alone. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Front row, the wrestler's name is Papa Shango. Uh, a voodoo practitioner who uh, cast spells on opponents and used his magical powers to cut the venue's lights out mid-fight. Wrestler or not? Definitely real. 100% real. Yeah, it sounds Definitely. like in that Kamala era, may have been uh, in the uh, precursor to Kamala. Yeah, brilliant deduction there. Uh, this is a wrestler, WWF 1992. Yeah, pre-Kamala. Yeah, I actually kind of remember that guy. Uh, and finally, back row. The wrestler's name <laughs> is McLovin. This fighter would woo his opponent's wrestlers and use them as bait to ambush his enemies. Hmm. I don't think there was a wrestler named McLovin. Uh, I think at this point it would be real. <laughs> yeah, I think there we go with a real. <laughs> I think it's real. Well, uh, it says it's not a wrestler, but the uh, the tape would show otherwise. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, as he scrambles around oh in that. Goodness. Well, the front row wins, and uh, the ladies win for that visual. The uh, Ooh, Boxcore yeah. Federation Tag Team Championship belt goes, of course, to the front row. Congratulations, guys. I liked when they would get on the uh, ropes, and like the Ultimate Warrior would shake the ropes like that. Like that was some tough thing to do. They're going to edit that video. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. dear. laughs> Spider-Man, don't go away. We are shopping for a new home, and we're going to use that belt as collateral. Uh, welcome back to the box score. Uh, this morning in the me uh, morning meeting, Polly, you pitched the boss on buying the Corleone's mansion from the uh, Godfather. So we went ahead and uh, went million dollar listing here in the box score and found some other movie homes or TV homes. And we're gonna have you guys, uh, just for giggles, guess the value of the home. Seaton, uh, mm -hmm. this Beverly Hills mansion is for you. It was also used in the Godfather and was home to the famous horse in the bed scene. It has five buildings, Cartoon. 28 bedrooms and 36 water closets. Any guesses as to the value of this place? That's Mr. Walt's house. Oh boy, I'm I gonna no say it's leader. $35 million. Wow, uh, 35 million. Yeah, 115 mil they're asking for that thing. Or you can rent it for wow. 600,000 a month. I think the jerk was also shot in that, that uh, swimming pool. McLovin, it's Probably the Probably also gonna live there. Yeah, McLovin, it's the sixth in the city beach house out in the boo, Malibu. It's got five bedrooms and three stories. Uh, this bad boy is only available for rent, though. How much do you think this is going for a month? <clears throat> Rental. Malibu, wow. That's a bad commute from there. So <laughs> I think that would suppress the values. I'm gonna say that goes for 9,000 a month. Hmm. Uh, brilliant deduction, $10,000 a month, maybe $1,000 too high. So good wow. job. Nice. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you might know this one, uh, though it recently sold. Uh, we w we here in the box where I purchased it and are selling it just for the sake of the uh, segment. Uh, it's Cameron's house from Ferris Bueller's Day <laughs> Off. Uh, how much you got for this house? Well, I remember the story, and I think we talked about it on air. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I thought it was 1.7 million. I may be a little high. Uh, just a little under what we have. We have 2.3 million asking price for that. <clears throat> Mm. I would kill for that house. Uh, Fritti, okay, this one's for you. It's the Modern Family House in Los Angeles. I'm doubtful oh. that Sophia Vergara is mm. actually ever there, but a, a man okay. can dream, right? Uh, how much you forking over for this place? <laughs> Emmanuel Four was also shot there. Oh, there you go. I'm going to say this, that is a $950,000 house. Uh, about halfway there. It's $2.15 million for that house. Wow. All right, well, that was fun, gentlemen. Fritzy, who's on tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, Charles Barkley will join us, the Hall of Famer from the NBA on TNT, Rich Eisen of the Rich Eisen Show, host of the NFL Network. Also, also a homeowner. Homeowner. Paul Feinbaum will join us, also the voice of the SEC, ESPN, college football analyst. Once rented an apartment. As well. All right, viva McLova Lucione. Okay, thanks for watching the box score. Uh, set your DVR or tune in weekdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, only on audio Channel 239. And uh, shell back. Hey, send some more of this. Oh, the podcast is available on iTunes or podcast1.com. I don't know a lot about sports, but I can drink a lot of beer. My motto is simple. C's get degrees. Need a long, inappropriate hug? I'm your man. I think I'm smarter than you because I probably am.
Hey! Thanks for watching the box score. Holy cow! This was a presentation of DirecTV, exclusive home of the Red Zone Channel, the Fantasy Zone, the Dan Patrick Show, 20 years of NFL Sunday Ticket, the Rich Eisen Show, and America's premier source for sports television.